Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, a warm welcome to this beautiful and historical church. We are gathered here to listen to two eminent speakers, President de Klerk and Mr. van Wolven. They will lecture on the role of Europe in the world. And in, this surround in these surroundings, um, I think I may even venture to say that I hope they will preach the gospel of Europe. And that should then be about redemption, not about fire and brimstone. This Amsterdam we will deal more in particular with the question of whether Europe plays an important role in world affairs. How do other countries evaluate us? Is Europe politically significant on the international scene? Are we really only an economic giant and a political dwarf? Do we neglect our international potential? I think many intriguing questions, which I hope will be extensively debated today. Perhaps a few additional words about the Europe lecture. It was set up in order to stimulate a public debate about Europe and to involve as many as possible in its future developments. Since I can imagine that many among you, among the audience, will have the urge to ask questions after these lectures, um, I'm very sorry, but since the available time is limited, the organizers of this 12th edition of the Europe lecture have asked me to act as a sort of a um, <clears throat> a shortcut to raise one or two questions on your behalf, which I then will ask to the two speakers. So after each lecture, I will try to formulate a few permanent questions, further clarifying the issues that may be unclear or that have been dealt with only in passing. It is now my pleasure and honor to welcome the speakers and first of all, Again, a very warm welcome to Pre for, uh, President the Cleric, Frederick William the Cleric. He was the seventh and last state president of the apartheid era in South Africa. He served from uh, September 1989 to May 1994. And he was, as you know, also the leader of the National Party which later became the new national party from February 89 till September 1997. I think that President de Klerk is best known for brokering the end of apartheid, South Africa's racial segregation policy, and supporting the transformation of South Africa into a multi-racial democracy by entering into negotiations that resulted in all citizens including the country's black majority, having equal voting rights and other rights. He won the Felix Mouret Boigny Peace Prize in 1991, the Prince of Asturias Award in 1992, and the Nobel Peace Prize in 1993, along with Nelson Mandela, for his role in ending apartheid. He also was one of the deputy presidents of South Africa, during the presidency of Nelson Mandela, that is to say until 1996, and if I may add, the last white person to hold the position to date. In 1997 he retired from active politics and as of 2011 remains an active lecturer, including of course lecturing here in the Netherlands, and I'm very proud that you are here today with us. A few more words, because in your first speech after assuming the party leadership, you called already on a non-racist South Africa and for the negotiations about the country's future. You lifted the ban on the African National Congress, ANC. You released Nelson Mandela. He brought apartheid to an end and opened the way for the drafting of the new constitution for the country based on the principle of one person, one vote. Also important is that in um, 2000, you established the pro-peace F.W. de Klerk Foundation, of which, of course, you are the chairman. You're also the chairman of the Global Leader Leadership Foundation, 
which you set up in 2004, and I am very privileged that also Mr. van der Broek, member of this uh, association, this foundation is among us. An organization which works to support democratic leadership, prevent and resolve conflict through mediation, and promote good governance in the form of democratic institutions, open markets, human rights, and the rule of law. It does so by making available discreetly and in confidence the experience of foreign leaders to today's national leaders. It's a not-for-profit organization and composed, as I said, of former heads of government, senior governmental and international organizations, officials who work closely with heads of government on governance related issues of concern to them. But today we will deal with Europe more extensively. And once again, I'm very happy, very privileged that President declared that you are among us to deliver your lecture and I invite you to the roster. Thank you very much. Geachte meneer de moderator, dames en heren, ik ga mij toespraak in Engels leren, maar een Afrikaner kan niet die verzoeking meer staan om wanneer hij in Nederland komt toch een beetje Afrikaans te praten. Het is heerlijk. Het is gaaf om weer in Den Haag te wees, in die stad van vrede en gerechtigheid, in een jaar wat voor u van groot belang is, die 200ste herdenking van die daarstelling van die, het Koninkrijk van Nederland en ik denk dus die 100ste verjaarsdag van die International Peace Palace. Zo so, dus gaaf om my taal te kan praat in een, in een land buiten Zuid-Afrika wat kan verstaan wanneer ik dit praat. I wish, ladies and gentlemen, to speak to you tonight, I have been asked to do so, about Africa's perspective of Europe. I would also like to discuss Europe's search for greater internal integration on the one hand, and its wish to play a more coherent role in the international community on the other. First, I wish to talk about my own relationship with Europe as the descendant of one of the many peoples throughout the world that trace their roots to your continent. My ancestors were Huguenots from France who came to South Africa via Holland in 1688. My language, Afrikaans, has its roots in the Dutch, Flemish and German, spoken by the employees of the Dutch East India Company and by the first settlers in the Cape. It also draws richness from the Malay language that was brought to the Cape by slaves from the East Indies. My religion derives from the Dutch Reformed Testament of Dort in 1619. My culture, like the cultures of so many peoples throughout the world, is suffused with the unparalleled literature, art and music of Europe. And yet, I am an African. For centuries, my ancestors have identified themselves with Africa. From the moment that more than 300 years ago, when Hendrik Bibo a Dutch settler in the Cape proudly proclaimed, Ek ben in Afrikaner. I am an African. <clears throat> 115 years ago, my people fought one of the first and greatest anti-colonialist wars in the history of Africa. The Anglo-Boer War was the costliest of the more than 40 wars that the British fought between the Napoleonic War and the First World War. 
It involved the deployment of more than 430,000 British troops and ended in the destruction of our country, the burning of our farms and the death of 27,000 of our women and children in concentration camps. So, despite my deep roots in the rich culture of Europe, I regard myself as an African. I identify with my continent. I strive to promote the interests of Africa in its relationship with other parts of the world. And I support its sports teams when they are playing teams from other continents. I mention all this because you from Europe sometimes forget the enormous impact that you have had on the rest of the world during the past 500 years. In that period, you colonized and populated three of the world's six inhabited continents, North and South America and Australasia, and conquered much of the rest of the world. Only 12 significant countries escaped European rule, and the sovereignty of the greatest of them, China, was severely limited by the imposition upon it of 62 treaty ports by the European powers and Japan. Southern Africa was deeply affected by the rising tide of European imperialism. Modern South Africa was forged in the wars of conquest that the British fought during the 19th century against the three dominant peoples of the subcontinent the Tosa, the Zulus, and the Afrikaners. At the beginning of the 20th century, Britain found itself in possession of a rag bag of vexatious territories in Southern Africa that one historian quipped it had acquired in a fit of absent-mindedness. What to do with these troublesome and expensive possessions? The solution? was to create a union or federation along the lines of the recently established British federations in Canada and Australia. And so the union of South Africa was born. A mere uh, 103 years ago, with artificial borders encompassing widely disparate peoples with divergent interests. Virtually all the rest of Africa suffered the same fate. The nations that now occupy the continent do not trace their genesis to common history, common language or common culture, but to the lines that were arbitrarily and cavalierly drawn by European imperialists pouring over maps in Berlin in 1885. For a relatively brief period of little more than 75 years, a single lifetime, Europe ruled its far-flung possessions in Africa. Europeans built cities and railways. They developed agriculture and trade. They brought European education and religion, nearly always to their own advantage, but often also to the advantage of the people that they ruled. And then at the end of the 50s and during the 60s, they left, almost as suddenly as they had come. The withdrawing tide of European rule left country after country in Africa floundering on the beach of independence, surrounded by flotsam and jetsam of empire. Constitutions that were not rooted in African traditions and ideas of government were hastily written and just as hastily torn up. Institutions of governance, independent courts and electoral commissions were often too shallowly rooted to survive the harsh African sun. Little wonder then that in so many African countries power quickly reverted to those who controlled the guns or the leaders of the most powerful tribal factions. 
In the process, many African countries developed a love-hate relationship with their former colonizers, loudly criticizing them at the OAU and the United Nations, but gravitating toward their capitals for shopping, for the education of their children, and to recharge their cultural patterns. The former colonial powers continue to provide the bulk of their foreign investment their foreign trade, most of their aid, and from time to time military intervention to shore up embattled regimes. During most of the 70s and 80s, many African countries were able to gain international traction by playing off their traditional European allies against the Soviet bloc countries that saw Africa as a primary sphere of contestation in their global struggle against the West. However, all that changed with the demise of the Soviet Union. South African President Thabo Mbeki was shocked when he was informed by senior European diplomats in 2003 that the European Union had no conception of a place for Africa in its global strategic assessment. Can you believe it, ladies and gentlemen? In 2003, President of South Africa was told the European Union had no conception, no place for a place for Africa in its global strategic assessment. In the intervening decade, the relationship between Europe and Africa has changed quite significantly as a result of the following developments. In the wake of the Euro crisis and uncertainty about the future of the EU's integration project, the global prestige of Europe has waned. The prestige of the emerging economic giants, particularly the BRIC countries, has grown enormously. And Africa has once again become an arena for global strategic interest. Based on its rapidly growing economy, its consumer markets, and its enormous potential as a primary supplier of minerals, oil, and food. First, therefore, there is the perception that the role of Europe in the world is waning. That is how it is seen from Africa. In the 17th and 18th century, at the very time when it was conquering much of the rest of the world, Europe produced only 12% of the global GDP, compared with the more than 45% generated by China and India. By 1913, following its emergence from the Industrial Revolution, Europe's share of GDP had risen to almost 30%, while the combined share of China and India had dropped to only 15%. In 2011, the Euro area's share had shrunk again to 17,1%, and the OECD projects that it will decline further to 11% by 2013, and only 8,8% .8 by 2016. Of course, this does not necessarily mean that Europeans will become poorer. It means that the rest of the world will become richer. By 2060, India and China will once again account for more than 45% of global product and will have resumed the preeminent role in the world economy that they occupied for most of the last 2,000 years. <coughs> but all this has gone hand in hand with rising levels of Euroscepticism. According to the European Council on Foreign Relations, trust in the European Union has fallen 
from plus 10% to minus 22% in France. From plus 20 to minus 29 in Germany. From plus 50 to plus 6 in Poland. And from minus 13 to minus 49 in the United Kingdom. In effect, the core Euro countries are now more skeptical about the European Union than the British were in 2007. The root of the problem lies in the divisions created by the Euro crisis. Northern countries cannot see why they should bail out the southern periphery countries without being able to control their spending. Southern countries in turn feel that they have been forced into an economic straitjacket that has seriously compromised their national sovereignty. There is also a perception that the EU apparatus in Brussels is too bureaucratic, too remote, and too unaccountable to the citizens of its member countries. British Eurosceptics argue that the maths of EU membership no longer make sense. Britain now exports slightly more to the rest of the world than it does to Europe. 15% of its economy is geared to European exports. Exports to the rest of the world account for another 15%, while the remaining 70% serves its own economy. However, although only 15% of its economy is directed towards Europe, 100% of the economy is subject to what Eurosceptics regard as onerous and constricting EU regulations. Let me deviate here and in light of vain tell a story. I attended a conference in Germany some time ago and a German industrialist in his speech said he counted the words of the Ten Commandments and there were only so many, very few. He counted the words of the American Constitution, they were more than the Ten Commandments, but very few. And then he counted the words regulating the imports of bananas into Europe, and they were about 30,000. The reality is, ladies and gentlemen, that the European single market just is not functioning as effectively as it should. That is how we see it also from Africa. According to the OECD, trade integration in the EU is still significantly lower than it is in the United States' largest federal economy. The EU's internal market remains fragmented in terms of trade and financial integration. This means that companies in the EU are generally smaller and less efficient than they are in the United States. The EU Commission, we know, is trying to address this problem with the single market project that it launched in 2011. But once again, the challenge is to get 28 sovereign countries to amend their national legislation and to pull in the same direction. The EU is aware of these challenges and of the need for structural reforms. It has set itself ambitious targets with its Europe 2020 strategy. But once again, success will depend on its ability to persuade member states to change their own national policies and institutions. And therein lies, from our perspective, the essence of the problem. The EU is like a giant tanker with 28 captains on the bridge each of whom must agree to make changes in the tanker's course to avoid the icebergs that they can all see ahead of them. One of the icebergs lying ahead of the EU is its looming demographic crisis. Birth rates in key countries have dropped far below the levels of sustainability. In Germany and Poland there are one uh, 1,3. In Italy and Spain, they are 1,4. Sustainability requires birth rates exceeding 2,1.
at birth rates of less than 1,5, populations will diminish by more than 75% by the end of the century. Populations will become older with fewer and fewer young people to support them. The only solution to plummeting birth rates would be massive immigration from other parts of the world. However, such immigration would create problems of its own and would fundamentally change the present character of Europe. So, undoubtedly, the European Union faces serious challenges. However, none of this detracts from the worthiness of the ideals that established the European Union in the first place. The world needs a strong Europe to counterbalance the influence of the United States on the one hand and the growing influence of China and India on the other. Africa needs a strong Europe. Africa still receives most of its investment from Europe and conducts most of its trade with the continent. Despite the much publicized expansion of Chinese interest in Africa, it is only the sixth largest investor in the continent, following the United States, France, Britain, Malaysia, and South Africa. There are strong historic and cultural ties between our continent, Africa, and your continent, Europe. However, Africans sometimes get the impression that they continue to occupy only a peripheral position in Europe's world view. Trade negotiations between Africa and Europe seem to have stalled. After 10 years of negotiations over economic partnership agreements with the 77 African, Caribbean and Pacific countries, only 36 have been concluded and only 18 of these are with African countries. In the wake of its current crisis, Europeans are calling for ambitious, proactive and constructive trade agreement engagements with its strategic partners. However, these partners are in the Americas and in the emerging Asian economies. In a letter earlier this year, Jose Manuel Barroso, President of the European Commission, urged Herman von Rompuy to develop such trade relationships. But, and here this, he made no mention of Africa or of the need to make progress with the stalled economic partnership agreements. Africa is not nowhere near the top of the agenda where it should be. Once again, Africa is getting the impression that it does not occupy a significant place in Europe's strategic planning. This is a mistake. Europe would do well to reconsider Africa's enormous potential and its growing strategic importance. According to the World Bank, Economic growth in sub-Sahara Africa is likely to exceed 5% on average between 2013 and 2015 because of high commodity prices worldwide and strong consumer spending on the continent. Total African GDP is expected to reach 2,6 trillion US dollars by 2020. The, re the region will remain one of the fastest growing in the world. In 2012, about a quarter of African countries grew at 7% or higher. Rapid urbanization on the continent is increasing demands for infrastructure investment in power, transportation, hospital and schools. Current infrastructure expenditure of about 45 billion US dollars a year is less than half the amount that will be required to fund these projects. 
Africa abounds with opportunities. And yet, Europe does not have a coherent strategic position on Africa. The central reality is that Sub-Saharan Africa constitutes the largest area of underdeveloped real estate in the world. There are about the same number of people in its 24 million square kilometers as there are in the 3,3 million square kilometers of India. The continent is endowed with enormous mineral resources in a commodity-hungry world, and it has virtually untapped agricultural potential. So Africa presents Europe with enormous opportunities. <laughs> However, there is another important reason why Europe should be interested in the future success of Africa, and why Africa is disappointed that Europe is not taking sufficient interest in Africa. It is because Europe, much more than any other continent, needs a prosperous Africa. Crop failures, Economic or political crises on the continent could turn the present trickle of African refugees across the Mediterranean Sea into an unstoppable torrent. For all these reasons, Europe needs to focus more attention on Africa. That is how Africa feels. But Africa also needs a strong Europe that will be able to play its proper role in the world. But to achieve this from our perspective, we feel that Europe will need to resolve its current challenges. It must make progress with its integration project, or it must develop some other design. It must restore confidence in its guiding vision and convince the Eurosceptics to rejoin the project and it must address its potentially catastrophic demographic crisis. Whatever happens, events in Europe will continue to play an important role in the future of Africa. Your success is fundamentally important for us. And at times, as you worry about Africa, Africa worries about Europe. Inevitably, I believe Europe is going to give Africa much more attention in its strategic worldview. Ladies and gentlemen, Africa is at the center for the next hundred years of what is going to happen globally. My plea today is for Europe to become competitive in Africa, much more than it is at the moment. I thank you. President, thank you very much, uh, or as you would say, by donkey. Um, during the conversation we had uh, just uh, a while ago, you explained that the word by comes from Banyak, uh, from the Malaysians, so you see that Indonesia, the Netherlands, and South Africa are also linked by language. Um, that was a very provocative, in a way, and very thought provoking speech you just gave. And it is now my honor and pleasure to ask a few questions, and I don't know whether it is the best if we sit together here to just answer these few questions in the light of the speech you have just given. 
and the number of uh, issues that you have raised, which I think merit a little further discussion. Does this have yes? Mr. President, the main theme of your speech was that Europe should focus more on Africa, that the future of Europe is intrinsically linked to the future of Africa. Now, if you look at the present situation in Africa, we see a lot of turmoil. Um, we see also a divided continent. If you look at the north, the middle and the south, you see different degrees of development. If you would, uh, let's say, try to sketch a recipe for a way in which Europe could intensify those relations, what would your idea be about it? Because I notice that you would say, first of all, that the European Union has already, of course, an ACP agreement, <coughs> African, Caribbean, Pacific. Um, development aid has been abundant in the past. We have really tried to do our best. Uh, trade of necessity is increasing because of, well, earth, materials, etc. And also because of the, what we call, or what we consider in a way, the Chinese threat. So, what would be the, the, the recipe? And also, I say link to that question, um, you have focused very much on what Europe should do towards Africa. What should Africa perhaps do towards Europe? few questions I just would like to raise. Let me share a few thoughts in reaction. Firstly, I think Europe needs to grasp the opportunities which Africa offers. The development aid is necessary. There are children dying every minute almost of hunger. We are suffering as a result of the scourge of malaria, of HIV AIDS of tuberculosis, there is a great need still for it. But the best way to help, and that can also be to the advantage of it, is to invest, is to take up that shortage of, I think if I remember my figures correctly, 45 billion, which are not available for new infrastructure, for your construction companies to become involved, Investment, job creation, which goes hand in hand with investment, is the surest way of assuring that Africa will become, for Europe, a better client, a better trade partner than it is at the moment. On the political side, Africa is slowly but surely moving in the right direction. If you take a uh, look at the research done by highly regarded institutions, you, and if you compare with 15 or 20 years ago how many full-blown healthy democracies there were in Africa, how many countries were on the way to democracy with sort of semi-democratic systems and how many dictatorships there were, and you compare it with the figures of today, there are more effective democracies than there were. There are many more countries already semi-democratic moving in the right direction. And consequently, the number of oppressive regimes have decreased dramatically. With my Global Leadership Foundation, which you referred to, we have contacts with many countries in Africa. I cannot talk about with you, but uh, because we operate discreetly and confidentially, but I can say that in my interaction with a number of African leaders, I've come deeply under the impression of the greater realism which has taken hold in Africa. Also, greater realism with regard to the economic and financial policies which need to be followed. The biggest scourge in Africa, where Europe can maybe help, is the fight against corruption. Of course, corruption, again, like racial discrimination, is not unique to Africa. It's just more sophisticated in the developed countries.
but corruption is a tremendous problem in Africa. And part of our activities in, in the Global Leadership Foundation is to try and help leaders to set up effective frameworks to counteract corruption, to prevent corruption, and, and to fight corruption. Uh, Europe, I think, can only benefit from expanding its interaction in the business field, but also in other fields, with Africa. But once again, when we look at Europe, of course we see a different foreign policy from different leading countries in Europe. There isn't one coherent foreign policy within Europe. So, in practice, if one has to be very realistic, most African countries deal with individual European countries much more than they deal with the European Union. And that is the issue on which Europe must decide where it is going to go. I don't want to expand too much on what I think Europe should do. I just have a feeling that if too much power is centralized in a federal-like government, the backlash against it will grow stronger and stronger amongst the membership countries of Europe. If, in a very logical way, only some of the very important aspects like security, like financial policy, is properly coordinated and if much more competition amongst the members of the European country is encouraged, I think there's a better chance of a European entity becoming an important role player also in foreign policy. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, very clear answer. Uh, if I may perhaps ask one more question of the time. Um, let's say I, I agree with this a lot of what you're saying. On the other hand, uh, Europe, uh, as I have said earlier, is still an economic giant. It still is the largest trading bloc in the world. It is also, as you mentioned yourself, one of the largest investors in Africa as a whole. I think uh, if I look at the situation, you see that there are two obstacles. First of all, is that Often, many European countries feel that as former colonial powers, they should be very careful, are sometimes reluctant to mix, to get involved in local political situations. Uh, secondly, of course, uh, there is China, which is, you briefly mentioned it, is trying, we get the impression, to occupy, let's say, the most fertile, as far as economy is concerned, areas of Africa. Um, do you think that Europe there too, uh, let's say, should move more quickly, more rapidly? And perhaps if we speak of Europe, we can also speak of a number of countries that are particularly interested in Africa, because I see the need that if we are dreaming about a European foreign policy, we uh, can continue dreaming still for quite a while. Unfortunately, as it is, but you have to deal with that situation. So that also is, I think, one of the difficult issues, you know. Yes, Europe, I think, is very interested in Africa. It has demonstrated so in the past by its very limited amount of development aid. Uh, it is of necessity interested because of the natural resources, but it needs, let's say, a lot of obstructions on its way to, let's say, to get a better place. Well, let me just start out by putting the mind of the Netherlands at this. You are no longer regarded in South Africa as a colonial power. Britain is. You've been forgiven for colonizing the Cape in 1652. Uh, I, I would like Europe and its member states, the European Union and its member states, to become more competitive in Africa. Amongst before we get to China, which is number six of investors, only two European countries feature. 
Also in the top five is the USA and Malaysia and South Africa. So there is room and space for other European countries to become much deeper involved on the investment side. And investment doesn't mean handouts. Investment means doing business. So we would like that to happen. The one thing on which European investors can capitalize is that China, when they enter into these long-term supply agreements with regard to oil, coal, iron, gas, and whatever, then make up packages which says, hey, in the process we'll build your railway, we'll build your dam, we'll do this and that, but then they bring in Chinese labor, and there's a big, there's a big backlash building up in Africa against that, they want jobs to be created. So, that's one issue on which Europe can maybe get a competitive edge. I think one big problem for European investment lies in corruption. You have laws restricting companies to participate in practices in which other countries, uh, no, no names, no problems, in which other countries still free to participate. And that is something which needs to be studied, which needs to be analyzed, and uh, which needs to be counteracted, and action plans need to be developed in that regard. Mr. President, thank you very much. Uh, I think you have uh, laid down a clear blueprint. It's now up to us to act, and uh, those who are uh, closely involved in European matters, I think your message was, was very clear. Uh, and I must say, I, I have been listening, and I'm sure also the entire audience has been listening with the greatest attention to what you have to say. And I think you have to continue to spread the gospel, you know, of a closer relationship, a closer cooperation between our two continents, because I'm sure that that is also where our common future lies. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we come now to uh, the, the second speaker, uh, Mr. Karel van Wolveren. I think uh, Mr. van Wolveren uh, is uh, somebody who is quite well known in the Netherlands, so I hardly need to introduce him, but for those who are not acquainted with his latest activities um, and with his uh, curriculum, I want just to say once again that uh, Karel van Wolveren is the Dutch journalist, He's a writer, he's a professor, and I think that he is particularly recognized for his knowledge of Japanese politics, economics, history, and culture. He has traveled widely in the Middle East, India, Southeast Asia, and from 1962 till the 90s, he was based in Japan. In 1972, he became a correspondent for the Dutch daily NSA Handelsblad, reporting from many countries in Asia. In 1987, he received the highest Dutch award for journalism for his articles on people power revolution in the Philippines, an uprising which forced President Ferdinand Marcos to flee the country. His book writing career began in 1969 when he was commissioned to do a study on student radicalism in the West, and the result of this was published as Student Revolutionaries of the 60s, reviewed by the International Herald Tribune as the best introduction to the subject. After a career as foreign correspondent, he wrote The Enigma of Japanese Power, first published in 1989, and as publication is, has sold well over 650,000 copies in 11 languages. And I have read that in Japan this book received enormous attention and that the Asai Shenmun called it an elaborate and persuasive study, sharply and carefully analyzing a multitude of aspects of Japanese reality. While the Financial Times wrote, this most thoughtful of books works because it is serious, 
well-informed and, above all, objective. Since writing the Enigma, Mr. Van Wolven has also more than 15 books published in Japanese that explore details of political, economic, social and historical aspects of, Japanese, of the Japanese power system. These books also have sold over one million copies. He was made a university professor of comparative political and economic institutions at the University of Amsterdam in 1997. And since then he has continued to write books and articles for Japanese readers. And if I'm well informed, he still divides a little bit of his time, if he spends a little bit of his time in East Asia. In 2005, together with NSA Handelsblad reporter Jan Sapiemon, he wrote a current in the Vaderlands of Geschiedenis, in Dutch, for those who don't understand uh, English, a turning point in the history, uh, who don't understand Dutch, a turning point in the history of the Vaderland. Its secondary title is a manifesto to the Dutch people. And despite this Vaderland in the title, referring to the Netherlands, the book is mostly about the changes in the foreign policies, among others of the United States of America. But he also is a keen observer of the European scene, and uh, I think we're very fortunate that uh, today, after the very interesting speech of President de Klerk, Mr. Van Wolven will also lecture about the role of Europe in the world, how do countries look at Europe, are we still important, can we play a role, not only in Africa, but perhaps also on other continents. I'm very privileged uh, and honored to give the floor to Professor Van Wolven. President de Clare, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, never in my life did I imagine that one day I would be speaking to a packed church of all things. <clears throat> and I thank the Montesquieu Institute for giving me this privilege to do so. All the more my regret that what I'm going to say is considerably less cheerful than I would have liked it to be. The question was, what does the world think of Europe? It does not dwell on it very much, I am afraid. Our continent is not doing much that makes it an entity about which one should have an opinion at all, except for its undeniable significance as an enormous market. Diplomatically, it is virtually invisible. It is not a power broker, and it does not offer ideas about good international living that reverberate in other continents. When Japanese, Chinese, Americans, and I suppose people from Africa and South America think about it at all, they do so <clears throat> as an area that may want to visit because of its sublime concentration of tourist attractions. In that respect, there is no place quite like it. When serious observers of international affairs think of Europe, they most likely regard it as a realm of unrealized promise. In the earlier stages of European unification, the unifiers and their supporters conceived of their union as something that could and would become nothing less than a good example, something to look up to and for the rest of the world to emulate. There was talk of a new European century, of Europe as a paragon of international virtues. One of Europe's foremost philosophers, Jürgen Habermas, wrote that after solving the problems of welfare systems and governments beyond nation states, Europe was in a position to defend and promote a cosmopolitan order on the basis of international law. This kind of optimism used to be fairly widespread and some of the assumptions that went into it are still taken for granted, as I discovered at the University of Amsterdam. 
The claim to superior political virtue and other self-congratulation have, in fact, produced rather supercilious attitudes even now, which understandably irritate Americans and the rest. The thinking of outsiders contrasting reality with earlier expectations is not much different, then, of what a vast number of people inside the Union think. With Europeans themselves, the reality comes across as consisting more sharply of broken promises with respect to everyday matters, when they see welfare provisions dwindle, job security eroded, and proliferating nonsensical rules coming out of Brussels. The central technocracy, moreover, has helped create a smokescreen behind which national governments may hide and escape accountability. In the southern nations and Ireland, things are of course much worse, which brings us right away to what the Euro crisis demonstrates, a basic failure at the root of most of Europe's other failures. It is by now fairly well known that the architects of the Euro understood perfectly well that the political underpinnings for the common currency were not there. We also know that these pioneers were confident that this gaping hole, where a political fundament ought to have been, would be repaired when necessity forced their successors to get going on them. Optimism of these architects of European unification was at the time not cancelled by the simplistic thinking of those who had convinced themselves that you can have an economically integrated Europe, an ever-growing huge market without political borders, where trade could flourish unimpeded without such a thing requiring political institutions for solving the political problems that would inevitably follow from integration. Most prominent among them was Mrs. Thatcher. I had one brief opportunity, by the way, to talk with Mrs. Thatcher personally at a symposium where this very issue had been raised. She was extremely friendly to me, but it meant nothing to her, and she gave no inkling of having any thoughts consonant with the gravity of the subject. How can such blindness exist? One reason is the disastrous habit of separating economic and political thought. The two subjects live their own unconnected lives at universities and editorial offices. So while the Euro crisis is a political matter, it has been dumped in the laps of mainstream economists who are notoriously uninterested in historical perspective. Furthermore, and connected, is the stepmotherly treatment of everything that has a bearing on power. Economists are scared of the phenomenon. It upsets their models because power does not lend itself to quantification and because it threatens their belief that they are engaged in a universal science that tells truths independent of time and place. Political scientists, although they have their noses rubbed in it all the time, also prefer to turn their backs on the facts of power for similar reasons and because they do not want to sound like Marxists. They often use the term power when they mean influence. There is, of course, no question that the European Union is a political entity. It cannot be anything less. But through the neglect of political necessity, it is a weak and ineffective one. In discussions about what has gone wrong in social life, the arguments are often cast in moral terms, and so it has been with the failures of Europe. When such an approach leads to a comparison of the caliber of the heads of government today with the caliber of political figures in whose footsteps they follow, we may learn something. A moral investigation into motives and priorities helps explain the rather obvious fact that politicians who could make a difference today do not measure up. But it is unhelpful to put populations under a moral magnifying glass. The frequently heard explanation that an integrated Europe does not have much of a political future 
since the people in the member countries cannot be expected to get on with each other because of deviating habits or lingering hostility does not address the core of our problem. It is more useful to look at structural factors that have helped block the European Union to deliver on expectations and promises. I want to go into two of them. They are known as Atlanticism and neoliberalism. The quality of a political entity is recognized on the outside by its cohesion and integrity, by its ability to deal with and act upon other political entities. In other words, by its presence in the world besides being a tourist destination and commercial giant. What is the source of the obvious European debility as a political entity? Well, the countries who have signed up to be part of the Union have other loyalties. And those loyalties have seriously begun to undermine the original European effort to build excellent political civilization. The member states do what Washington tells them perhaps grudgingly and with distaste, but on global matters they are subservient. This passes for proper conduct among allies. But covered up is the fact that there is no alliance, at least not in the accepted definition of the term. An alliance exists for the purpose of shared goals. There was one once during the Cold War. But after the demise of the common enemy, the Communist Soviet Union, the alliance collapsed because of the transformation into militarism and the fundamentally altered priorities of its dominant member. The United States is not the ally Europeans used to have. Command has replaced consultation. Times are long gone when any kind of public conversation between Europeans and Americans about harmful American action has a chance to resonate in American corridors of power. Europe's erstwhile geopolitical protector, the main architect of the relatively stable post-World War II international system, has become a tragic case of domestic malfunctioning and delusions of unattainable international grandeur. America's transformed sets of purposes and methods are, to say the least, inimical to what an integrated Europe was supposed to stand for. Unfortunately, European political elites have, epistemologically speaking, remained stuck in the Cold War. We are faced with an American tragedy and a blind free world. To substitute for the erstwhile alliance are relations of vassalage, of servitude. They have, of course, not been formally identified for what they are. The transatlantic political arrangement would collapse if reality were acknowledged. But as it looks at the European Union, Washington sees not one political entity but a collection of vassals, needy subjects who, with varying degrees of reluctance, do as they are told. The Lisbon Treaty has reinforced the vassalage by stipulating that the defense of the Union falls under NATO, <clears throat> NATO with its subservient personnel, joint military operations, and strategic outlook is a liability for Europe. After the Cold War, it has served as a reservoir of reserve troops for America's wars that are illegal by the tenets of international law to which the European Union subscribes. Attempts to substitute new enemies for keeping NATO together have not been credible. The war on terrorism is an impossibility. You cannot have a war if you cannot sit down with enemies to negotiate a peace treaty. I am aware that the Netherlands has probably the highest concentration of Atlanticists, so it would not surprise me 
if I'm standing before a skeptical church here. But if what I say strikes you as exaggerated and unrealistic, this may be due to the fact that the majority in European populations are only very haphazardly informed by a press that after the Cold War has become shy of exploring to any depth changes in power relations that determine how our democracies are nowadays organized. Neither editorial bureaus nor political elite circles are questioning fundamental free world assumptions. More people in high positions than you might think see this clearly enough, but they will not say it out loud. Honesty would endanger their future prospects. They are a, a lot like journalists who worry about their jobs and do not want to be marginalized. As long as Europe continues to be a composite of separate vassals, the hindrance to its further political integration will remain enormous. Again, a political entity takes shape as it responds to other powers. Effective response requires a center capable of strategic thought and action. Call it a sense of political accountability. All we see now is a huge emptiness in the heart of Europe. Europe's lamentable status is most obvious when we look at global diplomacy. The European Union is not an arbiter of global anything. It is relatively naked, diplomatically speaking, in the face of ever-increasing Chinese power and of a Russia that without question will play a role in all our future. It treats other parts of the world in a manner that suits current Washington preconceptions. If this were different, Europeans would have tuned in with the Bolivarian revolution taking place in Latin America. They would have accepted the Chinese initiative for strategic cooperation. They probably would change their attitudes toward IMF insistence on structural adjustments in keeping with the so-called Washington consensus that have worsened African poverty. Remember when Schroeder and Chirac denied George W. Bush a Security Council endorsement for the invasion of Iraq? If at that time they had clearly explained to their own citizens and the world that the UN Charter was too valuable for the world to violate, they would by one stroke have established Europe as a primary player on the world stage. At the moment, 10 years later, Europe's global influence is, if anything, negative, as it helps encourage the United States to hang on to its fantasies. Anti-Americanism, long a European tradition, has unfortunately made things murkier than necessary. It has helped prevent honest discussion on transatlantic relations by a companion tradition of dismissing critical assessments with the charge that they are inspired by hostile sentiments. Anti-Americanism diverts attention from the tragic metamorphosis that I am talking about. One way of gaining perspective on your own situation is to imagine what would happen if you try to extricate yourself from it. Well, it is not easy to escape from the neo-feudalist transatlantic embrace because of the intimidation mechanisms available to Washington and member states allow themselves to be intimidated. If you think I may have lost a sense of proportion here, please consider the manner in which in Japan, the first cabinet formed by a new ruling party, which by the way ended half a century of virtual one-party system, was in fact overthrown by Washington. This is not generally known, except in Japanese circles who hope to achieve true national independence. But it was triggered by serious attempts of the new Japanese government to improve relations with next-door China. 
What you have heard about the Japanese-Chinese quarrel since then has primarily been caused by right-wing political mischief made possible because of the sudden vacuum where a new China policy was being developed. The overthrown Japanese cabinet was getting in the way of Washington's so-called pivot toward Asia. This recently adopted approach is generally taken to be a set of policies aimed at containing or isolating China. And that, in turn, is part of a paramount aim inherited from the neoconservatives and known as full spectrum dominance, which drives American international actions. They are in nobody's interest, least of all that of the United States itself. Full spectrum dominance is fantasy. It must substitute for a feasible strategy with which Washington can approach the rest of the world with positive results. Part of the American metamorphosis is a situation in which two of the most important instruments of the state, the military and the financial system, cannot be used effectively by an American government because they are not under political control. It greatly worried President Eisenhower that this might come to pass with the military when he addressed the nation on TV with his farewell speech and coined the expression military-industrial complex. The reality today is a great deal worse than what Eisenhower imagined. The connection between an uncontrolled military and an uncontrolled financial system has not been obvious to all because of that fateful separation of political and economic frames of reference that I mentioned earlier. But we need not pursue this at length to see that rather than the state controlling the financial system, things in the United States have turned upside down as bankers and their allies determine policy. And lo and behold, thanks to a developing transatlantic plutocracy, that phenomenon has crossed the Atlantic as well. Which brings us to the other big reason for Europe's unfulfilled promise that I mentioned, neoliberalism. Once again, as a result of their reluctance to think about these things in power terms, economists and others who are regarded as professional explainers have not served as well. Post-World War II capitalism, the kind almost all of us grew up with, has in recent decades undergone a revolution, one that has changed relations between the citizen and the state. If on the outside a cohesive, stable political entity is known by how it, is, <coughs> how it conducts itself among other political entities, on the inside it is known by how it treats its own people. And if it claims to be democratic, the question is whether it recognizes them as citizens who matter politically. In other words, does the political entity in question see a public and understands its responsibility for keeping public facilities in good health? The term democratic deficit is well known in European circles. What has had most attention is the inability of the citizens of member states to influence policies developing on the union level. The European Parliament in Strasbourg is a fledgling institution never given a thought by most Europeans. Because national economic policies of the member states are largely supervised by a Brussels technocracy and nationally elected politicians have discovered the convenience of hiding behind European directives, many of them being rather stupid, European citizens have become more scathing when referring to democracy at home. But there's something else, something actually much bigger that ought to have attention. That is what has happened in between the level where citizens exist and the level of government. In normal states, there have, of course, long been politically significant entities between the two that in some way regulate communication between these highest and the lowest political levels of the state, political parties foremost among them. 
And there have long been institutions in between that are theoretically non-political in the form of business organizations, which nevertheless have in varying degrees had a significant influence on how policies are arrived at and what form they may take. It has long been understood that there must be safeguards to make sure that these non-representative but politically significant entities do not arrogate power to a point where it eliminates the relevance of citizens on the political scene. Because too little attention was paid to the necessary political underpinnings for ensuring orderly free market capitalism, the European Union created a huge space for corporate power to run rampant. Hence, in Europe, the capitalist revolution has in some respects been pushed along further than even in the United States. Lots of arrangements that accompanied the expansion of the Union were lobbied for, inspired by, and sometimes forced through by the power of politically well-positioned corporations, which made huge profits, for example, through the privatization of state-owned sectors of formerly communist countries. An immensely important development, the financialization of large parts of business, must be understood to grasp the full story. It made the rise to high political position of bankers possible, and the intertwining of their tribe with the tribe of politicians to a point where it is sometimes becomes difficult to tell them apart. The Greeks, Portuguese, Irish, Spanish, and Italians are not guilty of creating the euro crisis. What actually happened is that Europe's northern banks had gorged on the so-called poisonous assets created by their counterparts in the United States, which rendered them technically bankrupt, those of Germany foremost among them. The Merkel government did what governments often do when faced with unspeakable reality. It changed the subject. As a result, in no time, North Europeans imagined that though Southerners had something to do with the crisis, especially Greeks, who did not work hard and did not pay their taxes. Let us play the so place the so-called Troika that has been put in charge of the crisis in its proper neoliberal perspective. A prominent role was given to the IMF, an institution with a dismal neo-colonial track record of ruining economies in Africa and South America. It had almost been pronounced dead as Latin Americans wanted to have nothing to do with it anymore. But Europe gave it new importance and with that particular move imported the American Treasury as a controlling agent. Look at the ECB which is forbidden to function as a genuine central bank. And while we are at it, look at the most notorious of investment banks, Goldman Sachs. What you will see is their connecting, revolving door through which the top people move on their way to new jobs. How did all this come to be? Aside from the earlier mentioned intellectual failures, the current situation serves a plutocracy that has emerged unhindered as social democratic parties all over Europe believed that they had to move with the times and make common cause with financialization. While critical journalism, more and more beholden to corporate power, simply faded away. The evolving situation is very welcome to quite a few individuals and entities that are raking in lots of money. When the credit crisis hit European shores, the transatlantic plutocracy began to determine what would happen to the Eurozone and with that, the European Union. A critical mass of European politicians have been misled to take for granted that the success of Europe's economies revolved around the continued existence of the present banking system and it was abundantly clear from the outside that the bankrupt banks would be given privileged treatment at the expense of Europe's citizens. On to current financial crisis policies 
that have made many all over the world wonder whether the politicians in charge are rational creatures. What is being rescued, or rather, what is the target of the rescue attempt, are not the economies of the member states, which is what a mostly credulous European public is made to think. But the bankrupt banks in France, in the Netherlands, and most of all in Germany are the target. When German citizens complain that their tax money is wasted on helping the Greeks, they are for the most part unaware that it is actually used for the sake of the balance sheets of their own banks. And to keep this particular set of policies going, everyone in Europe has fallen under the dictates of austerity issued by the masters of finance. You have no doubt heard the expression marketplace of ideas. It is a misconceived metaphor, popular because of the notion that markets are the ideal arbiters of what is valuable and what not. But ideas are not traded, they are not scarce, they can be multiplied at no cost to allow millions of people to swallow them. And they are rarely judged by their worth. For a proper metaphor, we ought to imagine ideas as capable of creating fevers and epidemics. The notion of necessary austerity to make an economy run better is a virus. It has spread from the United States to everywhere in Europe. It has created an epidemic that has made economies very sick. It could end the European Union if no medication of powerful sound common sense is applied in time. Starving the public sector as a recipe for economic healing has never worked, aside from isolated cases with very special circumstances. The last time we had something resembling it was in the days of bleeding or bloodletting as a medical remedy for lots of illnesses. Surgeons in ancient Greece and medieval Europe believed that illness might be caused by an imbalance of humors in the body something to be cured by extracting large amounts of blood from their patients. A fainting patient was considered proof that the treatment was working. The weaker ones naturally died from this. Now, the difference between bloodletting of bygone times and the economic austerity now in vogue and most gruesomely applied to Greece is that bloodletting was frequently not fatal while starving countries' public sectors leads inexorably to recession and depression. This, in short, is the situation in a Europe where commentators and policymakers have been holding their breath, waiting for Angela Merkel to get an election result enabling her to, follow, to form a coalition that continues to combat non-existent inflation and continues to hide the rotten state of German banks behind an opinion mist of rhetoric that blames others for what has gone wrong. The crisis of the European Union is, in the end, a conceptual crisis, one that is being treated by officials who are intellectually crippled through presuppositions derived from ideology and made rigid by opportunism. The medicine men and women of Europe operate within a universe of thought that has become useful to them, but that is charted with no longer valid mental maps on which revolutionary transmutations have not been registered. In the same way that the Atlantic Alliance that we grew up with is no longer, the post-World War II capitalism we grew up with has changed beyond recognition as well. It is the failure of Europe's politicians to acknowledge this and act accordingly that is wrecking what was once proclaimed as the most interesting and hopeful experiment in modern political history. Europe, as envisaged by its post-World War II pioneers, is disintegrating. The solidarity that officials invoke is not there. Skeptics are likely to say that it never existed. I disagree. It was destroyed. I thank you very much for your attention.
Congress Rob Wolfer, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for your uh, intriguing speech. Uh, that certainly was uh, hell and brimstone uh, that we uh, received today, but that uh, makes the discussion, I think, uh, perhaps even more interesting because um, I would now also like to have uh, a little discussion with you about uh, a number of uh, well, ideas which you have put forward, or rather the way in which you have painted a fairly bleak picture of Europe and its future. First of all, Professor uh, Van once again, many thanks uh, for this uh, indeed, uh, as I say, thought provoking lecture. I think it's very good if we are uh, once again confronted uh, with this harsh reality. The question only is, uh, uh, don't you think that perhaps it's a little bit too harsh? Um, and I'm saying this because uh, if you look back at the, over the past 50 years, you also say much that Europe has brought tremendous uh, progress, uh, economic development, um, that the welfare, general welfare in Europe uh, is unparalleled. Uh, also, if we compare it with many other continents, I think not even the United States, uh, <coughs> let's say, can uh, come up to the level of development uh, of taking care uh, of its citizens the way Europe is doing. Um, the, the second remark is that, uh, from my experience, from several others here who have been toiling in the garden of Europe, is that uh, often we have managed slowly uh, but surely to overcome crisis. And of course, we are living at the moment, at the moment in a period of crisis. On the other hand, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, everybody, all the economists, at least, at least if you may believe economists, are saying that we are gradually that the economy is improving, um, that uh, European countries are, let's say that the economy is, is well, I don't want to say prospering, but it's growing again. Um, and that uh, also, if I look at the political situation, you could argue that what is going on at the moment in, let's say, realizing the banking union, that is to say, let's say, handing over more sovereignty to Brussels, may also help us to overcome this indeed tremendous crisis which we have gone through, but perhaps it was also a sort of a cleansing uh, project uh, that we needed. Uh, we needed to come back to Earth and uh, then you, well, have to suffer for a while and then you hope that you come back again to those ideals which are still, I think, that uh, lying at the root, at the bottom of the European adventure. So, yes, uh, um, I uh, acknowledge and I understand, let's say, the picture you have painted of the situation in which we are. On the other hand, I also see that all the members of the European Union uh, are happy to remain within the European Union, perhaps with the exception of Great Britain, but even there, I do not believe that in the end they will be daring enough to say, we quit. There are many countries that are knocking on the doors because they want to be let in, which also say something about the European Union. So <coughs> I just want to <coughs> also paint a little bit the other side uh, in order to stimulate the debate. And uh, yeah. I'm wondering how you are going to answer that question. So, uh, <laughs> to begin with, let me say that uh, I agree with much of your listening on the positive aspects of Europe, of course. But I came, I was asked to talk about Europe's role in the world. And Europe's role in the world isn't very visible, and there's a reason for this, and this is what I addressed. Now, even then, uh, even if you look at the great achievements of Europe, and you know, I, I had a very good life in Japan, I lived in East Asia, it was my stamping ground, I knew it, I felt at home in it, but I decided to move here because I was very interested in Europe. That was my, the main reason for coming here, and I had very high expectations too. So I'm one of those people who have expectations 
then everything really basically destroyed. Uh, I think that Europeans, European political circles, again, they're missing all their laurels, and they say, look, what we have achieved is great, it's fantastic. If you ask me, you know, what's the, one of the greatest things that Europe has done? Well, it has made other countries, some other countries, think about abolishing the death penalty. That's one of the great, great things that Europe has done. Yes, it's very important. I'm thinking in terms of political civilization. And this is an important stuff, even though you wouldn't really think so. And Europe has had and can have other very good examples. But Europe has fallen into the wrong hands. And I don't mean people like you, of course. But, <laughs> but I think that, again, you know, all these positive things, wonderful. Give me half an hour, another half an hour, and I will give you an even more listening for positive things. But once again, we are talking about Europe in the world. And at the moment, Europe in the world is really not a significant entity whatsoever. And you can't deal diplomatically with powers that are developing. I, I, I agree with, uh, with President Leclerc. Powers that are developing and that require a strategic and diplomatic approach. No, I agree with you that uh, perhaps, uh, let's say, as a political entity, uh, we are not as strong as we should be. But there again, the question is, are we moving in the right direction or not? And uh, I ask this question because if you look at the United States, if you look at China or India, it is a very slow process and integration is not something that is happening from one day to the other. And I think what has been accomplished in a very short period of only 50 years, economically, but also politically speaking, that we are on the right track. It could be better. But I think that we are able at the moment to move towards a banking union that the central bank, which also castigated, uh, let's say, rather seriously, is, let's say, will be the supervisory body of 127 banks in the near future, that the countries are firmly uh, decided uh, to have this fiscal union, etc., that all points in a certain direction. And I agree with you, at the moment, uh, the, our influence is not uh, as important as it should perhaps be given our economic standing, but on the other hand, I say as long as there is the wish also from the peoples of Europe to, uh, let's say, come to a more political union, that I have the feeling that slowly but surely we will, well, may I say, inching forward. Yes, I, if you had said all this to me before 2008, I would hardly agree, have hardly agreed with you. But what has happened since the Euro crisis broke shows that the political class in Europe is not up to this challenge because it doesn't understand it. Now, you are right. There is an inching in the direction of the solution. Absolutely. I follow it, of course, as much as possible. As you follow it, you realize that this inching isn't necessary. It could go very fast. They could be running in the right direction. If what I have been talking about could be in some ways, could sink in among people who matter. You have to get rid of some very important, very tenacious, ideological suppositions. And you have to re-examine the motivation of governments. I'm talking, of course, about Berlin. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? Even for Germany's future, it would be very good if they adopted a policy, and I'm not the only one thinking this. I can send you emails with a lot of, a lot of commentary on this subject. People who have, have thought about this very thoroughly. There are ways to get around this. And I see this is not happening. Why? Be basically because of a lack of imagination. And, as I said before, there is a growing plutocracy in Europe that is served well by this current situation. 
They, if they, they like to send you forward, but they certainly wouldn't want the running forward because they would lose the opportunities they now have to make lots of money. Uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, this, this is a too weak a picture of, of reality. Um, I think that we are inching forward, not because we can be willing, uh, because let's say to unite 28 nations under one foreign policy or under one policy, it will be a, a very slow and lengthy process. If you look at the United States and how many decades, if not uh, ages, it took, let's say, before they reached the point that they were willing to play a role on the international scene. I think that Europe is not doing so badly. I acknowledge that uh, at the moment we are not, let's say, a very influential power, but uh, don't underestimate what an economic presence does in many parts of the world. Uh, and uh, all I want to say is that, yes, I think it is very right that you have pointed out, let's say, all these weak spots uh, in the European Union and in the setup. On the other hand, what I, want to, what I am trying to do is to point out that there are also a number of positive elements that permit is to go forward, that it is still is a cohesive union, that we are still looking for solutions, and that we have seen over the past 50 years, and I have lived 24 years of my career in Brussels, that each time if the crisis was, was at its zenith, that we always managed to find solutions Yes, very slowly, but we arrived at a common uh, point of view that then was readily accepted. And my hope is that as the economy is improving again, that also these positive sentiments will grow into an awareness of the importance of a united Europe, also politically speaking. Well, Mr. Bot, I'm on your side. I very much hope that what you were saying is correct, basically speaking. But, you know, I don't want to compare Europe with the United States in the same way that I don't want to compare myself to other people when I'm talking, I'm thinking about what I could become. Because you should look at what you can become, not at what others have become. That, putting that aside, I think that the idea that it is hoped now because economies are improving, it depends on whose statistics you read and whose analysis you read. And I think that uh, we do not have proper information for most people. There is no public sphere in Europe. There is no way for Europeans to board this away from each other, to talk with each other. It's all gone, it goes through American and British editors because English is the lingua franca. People in Europe are informed about other parts of Europe through the New York Times. A reliably unreliable newspaper. <laughs> and the Financial Times, half of whose circulation is in the United States, and the economists, more than half of the circulation is in the United States, and the editors know which side their brain is butter. They are not going to carry analysis that will get them on their own side of their realist and big power side. So, we are not informed about Europe here. We're not informed about East Asia, we're not informed about the, the Chinese, about Venezuela, or anything. We have no way, there's, there's no public sphere and that goes also for the economic situation. But that, therefore it is so important that we have a Europe lecture and we can have <laughs> Ideas, because I think it is the exchange that of ideas that lies, let's say, at the basis of growth and of progress. Um, and I think it is also very important that you analyze the situation, which in many respects is weak. But I think that on the other hand, there are many hopeful signs, and that we should try to combine the two. In other words, analyze, be honest with ourselves, acknowledge that many, many things are wrong. On the other hand, if you read the treaty, you read the preamble, and you see, let's say, that we do have a concept of where we want to go. 
that we haven't reached that goal yet, yes, I acknowledge. But I think that it is not excluded that in the near future, inching forwards, if we beat for the next year lecture, I'm on the other side. Year, <laughs> <laughs> I hope that we will have the same kind of very interesting exchange of ideas. But if I look again at the clock, uh, and I understand that we will have, after, after this uh, very interesting debate, that we will have the opportunity uh, to talk a little bit uh, uh, under the pleasure of a uh, good glass of wine or whatever. Uh, I want to thank you once again, but uh, I will say a few more words to both speakers. So thank you very much for your very interesting contribution. I hope that both contributions eventually will be appear in print so that we can really, let's say, feed ourselves with these ideas Let's say, reflect on them and see how we can improve the situation in general. Thank you, Mr. Bob, for being such a good Ladies and gentlemen, uh, at the end of this uh, indeed very stimulating and, as I said, sometimes provocative but always engaging lectures. To thank once again both speakers for, yeah, I think they're sort inspiring addresses because that is what, let's say, we all heard today. Because I also believe that the content of the lectures corresponded very well with the objectives of the Europe lecture, which is to stimulate public debate. And I hope that it was a stimulating public debate, involve as many as possible in future developments. And I think that in a period of Euroscepticism, and Professor Van Wolven has uh, very clearly, let's say, uh, identified uh, the reasons for that scepticism. And um, uh, I think that it is heartening also to hear words of encouragement. Because whatever we feel about the way some issues are dealt with in Brussels, whether we like it or not, the European Union remains the lifeblood of our economy and of our welfare society. Once again, I'm happy that such very distinguished speakers have contributed today in such a gracious and inspiring manner. But, of course, I will not let you go before also giving you a little present. Um, and I am just looking where the presents are, because they promised me the presents. <laughs> there they are coming. gentlemen, Santa Claus is near, and I know that there is the alderman, uh, also of The Hague, uh, who is uh, the acting mayor, also wants to present a picture, and I don't know uh, whether you want to do it from here or from there, but I let me invite you to say a few words. Um, I, I don't stop you for, from the brain, so I only want to give also a present and I'm sure I will do so on behalf of you, the people of The Hague, because we are very proud to have you here today. And thank you very much on behalf of the city of The Hague, also Karl van Wolfen. Thank you very much. Duty to open the reception. Thank you very much. 